Dear participants, welcome to this tripartite discussion, HCCH Ancetral Unidroit. My name is Christoph Bernasconi. I'm the Secretary General of uh, the HCCH, the Hague Conference on Private International Law. I have the pleasure of being virtually connected with Anna joubin brett who is the Secretary of UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and in that capacity she is also Director of the International Trade Law Division in the Office of Legal Affairs of the UN Secretariat. I am also joined by Ignacio Tirado, who is the Secretary General of UNIDROIT, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. Both, of course, are very distinguished lawyers with an impressive CV and professional experience, including, obviously, in various fields and topics to be discussed during this Codify conference. I wish to thank you both, uh, my dear friends and colleagues, for joining me uh, on this virtual panel from Vienna and Rome, respectfully. I am always happy to see the three sister organizations, as we like to refer to each other, appear together and to contribute in what I'm sure will be a meaningful way to this event. If I may just abuse for uh, a minute uh, the fact that I am moderating this uh, this panel and just start by introducing the uh, the HCCH. The HCCH, of course, is an intergovernmental organization, the origin of which goes back to 1893. The mandate of the organization is the progressive unification of the rules of private international law. The way we do this is by adopting international treaties, typically. We call them the HCCH conventions. There are about 40 of these conventions and other instruments uh, that are on the table, let's say. Um, and they can be classified in three separate divisions. Uh, there is uh, the International Family Law and Child Protection Division. There is uh, Transnational Litigation and Apostille. And there is the International Commercial and uh, Finance Law Division, to which we now also add the digital uh, economy uh, work. But in this last uh, division, we have three instruments, the 1985 Convention on the Law Applicable to Trusts and uh, on their recognition. So that's the Trust Convention with currently 14 contracting parties. There is the 2006 Securities Convention with currently three contracting parties. And there are the 2015 Choice of Law Principles, uh, the HCCH's only soft law instrument so far. But I guess it's fair to say that I will work in this field in the commercial and digital and finance uh, law area is less visible less developed than in comparison to, say, the international family law uh, or transnational litigation field in the apostille, where the relevant figures are quite different uh, indeed. All that being said, private international law is very important in uh, international commercial finance and indeed digital economy law. And we think, therefore, that it is very important uh, that we, uh, the HCCH, explore further work uh, in this field, uh, which would respond to real practical needs. And more on this uh, a little later, but uh, before doing so, I would like to pass the floor uh, to my dear colleagues, uh, Anna and uh, Ignacio, to briefly introduce the mandates of their respective organization. And uh, if you don't mind, Anna, I'll give you the floor first, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Christoph, for uh, this invitation to join uh, the, uh, this session. And uh, it's a great pleasure to, to greet everyone from Vienna. Uh, we are the babies, I think, in this group of uh, organizations, as we've only been set up 
1967. But uh, we're also the big ones in the sense that we're part of the United Nations. And we are one of the two legislative bodies of the United Nations General Assembly. One is the International Law Commission that traditionally develops public international law. And we are the ones developing international trade law. And uh, in our mandate, uh, quite um, you know, similar to the one of the two other organizations in this panel, uh, we're working on harmonization. We're not working on unification, we're working on harmonization and modernization of the law of international trade. And uh, this encompasses a very broad range of areas for our work. Uh, we are working in dispute resolution. That was the uh, uh, initial stage of Amsitra's uh, creation was uh, followed the uh, uh, New York Convention and uh, the adoption of the New York Convention then gave rise to further uh, unification, uh, further, sorry, um, harmonization of international trade law. We're working, as I said, in dispute resolution. We have a complete framework on uh, arbitration and a recently completed framework on mediation, always starting with a convention at the top and then going down through model laws and then rules and model provisions and then notes by the secretariats on how to use uh, the uh, and to apply the different uh, rules, conventions and model laws. We have also been working for many, many years now in electronic commerce, what, uh, what seemed to be very forward looking uh, some 20 years ago when we started working on um, electronic signatures. And since then we have developed a quite comprehensive framework on electronic commerce. And uh, this work is now moving into the digital uh, trade and digital economy area. Uh, as uh, Christoph mentioned, with a first model law that has been adopted by the uh, Commission in July of this year on digital identity management and trust services, which is, I would say, the bottom line uh, or the, 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 the fundamentals for uh, establishing digital trade. And we have various other areas of work. One is insolvency, which has been in Amsitral's mandate uh, again since many, many years, secure transactions, um, payments, trade finance, transport. We've just uh, uh, completed and pre will present to the General Assembly of the United Nations in December. Uh, a, um, a convention on the judicial sale of ships um, and of course anything to do with uh, a, and a special program that I, I always like to highlight which is on MSMEs and the way all these um, frameworks on international trade law actually apply and work for the very small uh, companies that form the the um, the uh, fabric of most of the economies of uh, Amsitra's membership uh, and uh, of the United Nations membership, of course. Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, very helpful and uh, comprehensive introduction of the mandate of uh, Ancetral. It was, of course, uh, very important to have Ancetral on board for this uh, uh, conference. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about commercial law and digital economy law and finance law without the presence of uh, Ancetral. So thank you very much indeed. And the same can be said about uh, Unidroit. And it gives me now the pleasure to ask uh, Ignacio to present uh, the mandate of Unidroit and its uh, work in this field. Over to you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, and thank you very much to the HCCH for inviting us to participate. It's a pleasure to share uh, time with you and with, with Anna and um, to get our three organizations together once again. Um, we are indeed uh, quite old as well. It was, uh, you know, Israel was founded in, in 1926 in the context of the League of Nations, uh, which was that beautiful social experiment which was tried in between wars, but unfortunately didn't go that far. 
Uh, we are a little bit, although we resist the middle child, don't we? Uh, with uh, The Hague as the oldest, Ancetral as the youngest child, and middle, the middle child always tries to get, to, to get attention of the others, and that's our permanent struggle. Uh, the, um, the work that we do um, is uh, very much complementary with the work of the other two organizations. Um, we, we do not do directly private international law, understood generally as uh, the subject matter has been academically at least understood, recognition, jurisdiction, conflicts of laws, uh, but rather we focus in our mandate on international private law and generally on private law matters. Um, so um, although the core of our activities has always been uh, on the commercial side, the truth is that it's, it's not necessarily so. And we do have worked for many years, especially in the, in, in the uh, initial decades on um, matters which concern private law strictly, including also um, uh, family law, cultural property, and matters which are not strictly commercial, if you will, if you will indulge me. Um, the um, work that uh, we are conducting and have conducted and purport to conduct in the future uh, concerning um, um, commercial law and financial law and digital law generally, which is, I think, uh, the uh, purpose of, of our colloquium today, um, is um, the following. And I'll try to summarize very briefly. Um, we uh, have done a lot of work um, on secure transactions and generally on access to credit. Uh, one of our signature uh, instruments is the Keep Down Convention on International Interest in uh, Mobile Equipment, uh, which um, has right now recently uh, become or is about to become 21 years old. Um, so uh, uh, very developed also in its implementation. We are very happy to say that it's uh, one of the most successful commercial law treaties in, 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 in history. Uh, with uh, 83 signatory states and a large amount of uh, of the business activity in the area of uh, of the um, aircraft leasing and um, financing um, conducted through the Cape Town Convention. It has four protocols, as you uh, probably already know. It covers different types of assets and equipment, mine, agricultural and construction, space and rail, apart from aircraft. Uh, the... Um, Work, another area of signature area of commercial work of, of UNISRA is uh, focused on international commercial contracts uh, with the UNISRA principles on international commercial contracts, which um, was uh, in its different iterations conceived as a restatement of, of contract law. And it is the single instrument which um, provides a, a comprehensive uh, um, um, best practice approach to commercial contracts. Uh, so it covers all types of commercial contracts. Um, it has been success successful in the sense that transnational law is successful. It has uh, um, helped reform and modernize many of the um, um, uh, most important uh, um, legal frameworks in, in, in commercial contracts around the world in the different geographic areas. Um, this is uh, very much in the general mandate of our organization, uh, which concerns harmonization and uniformization of, of private law generally. Um, um, although it's not always easy to differentiate both terms and the depth of, of their meaning, um, we are um, persuaded, and this is part of our uh, of our understanding of the mandate, uh, to not only help modernize the systems, but also make sure that they are consistent and, to some extent, predictable ex ante, so they provide legal certainty, lower transaction costs, and 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 therefore contribute to international commerce and international exchanges, and therefore to committee, and therefore to peace, which was. Uh, if I, if you will indulge me, uh, the origin of, of of the institute as a part of the League of Nations. Um, 
In the area of access to credit, always working uh, very closely with uh, and following and building upon the work of Ancestral, we've, we've, we're now in the process of finalizing a model loan factoring, uh, which is complementary uh, to the uh, legal guidance secure transactions of, of Ancestral. Um, and uh, together, jointly with Ancestral, model law on warehouse receipts, uh, all of those are, uh, let's say we can put them in one pack or package uh, of instruments, older instruments of ours concerning international factoring and leasing um, and other instruments of the of the type. Um, as to financial law, more strictly, an area which um, always um, is placed in the contours of uh, of regulation at some point, and therefore is always more difficult to. Um, 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 draft instruments which uh, are kept strictly within a mandate without really overstepping. So this is a permanent work that needs to be done and has been done in the past with a lot of attention and care. Uh, uh, is our work, for example, on the Geneva Securities Convention or Intermediated Securities, um, the work we've done on um, close-out netting, the principles on close-out netting, and uh, more currently the work we are doing uh, on um, bank liquidation, which are focused on, on small banks together with uh, the Bank of International Settlements. Um, they do the regulatory part and we do the private law part. And so that's how we, we share the work. And um, then um, perhaps the most directly linked type of work uh, with the topic that um, um, of, of relevance today is our work on digital assets and private law, um, which provides an analysis of the private law aspects of, of digital assets. So th this is, uh, and I apologize for taking too long, a little bit of an overview of the mandate and how that mandate applies to um, the areas of commercial law uh, and financial law. Over to you, Christophe, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much also, Ignacio, for this very helpful uh, presentation, introduction to the work of uh, Unidroit in this field. Um, I have only referred to our three uh, instruments in the field of the commercial, digital and finance law division without uh, mentioning uh, other instruments in particular uh, in the transnational litigation uh, field of, uh, of our work, which may indeed, of course, also be relevant in uh, what we are going to uh, discuss uh, throughout uh, this week. I'm, I'm thinking in particular uh, about our newest uh, instrument, the Judgments Convention, the 2019 uh, judgments Convention on uh, the Recognition and Enforcement of uh, Foreign Judgments in Civil or Commercial uh, Matters. Uh, those of you who uh, follow the news uh, relating to the HCCH will have noticed that uh, last week we had a major event in that the European Union and Ukraine deposited their instruments of ratification and accession respectively, which means that this important convention, uh, which I like to refer to as a, as a game changer, is going to enter into force uh, in the course of uh, next uh, year, September uh, 2023. There is, of course, also the Choice of Court Convention of uh, 2005, uh, which again may also be relevant in uh, our discussions uh, throughout uh, this week, which is a convention which uh, basically ensures the effectiveness of uh, exclusive uh, Choice of Court uh, agreements as envisaged by parties to a commercial uh, transaction. But um, as I was alluding to in my general uh, introduction, I think there is more work to be done uh, for the uh, HCCH, and particularly in the uh, digital uh, economy field. And um, that is the reason why our governing body, the Council on General Affairs and Policy, CGAP as we call it, has invited uh, has in fact invited uh, the Permanent Bureau to uh, take up work in this area as well. I quote from uh, this year's uh, CGAP uh, meeting, 
that uh, the HCCH members noted uh, the report uh, on the private international law implications of the digital economy, as well as the results of the questionnaire on the topics relating to the digital economy that are of interest to the members. And the members acknowledged the importance of the subject to the HCCH, and therefore mandated the PB to continue to A, monitor developments with respect to the digital economy, B, study the topic with a view to identifying private international law issues for potential future work, including through discussions at the Codify conference, what we are presently doing, and C, work with other organizations in the field, such as Ancitral and Unidroit which we are also doing uh, as we speak, uh, but you see that there is an explicit reference to the cooperation with Incitral and uh, Unidroit in our uh, CGAP conclusions, and D, then report to CGAP uh, at its 2023 meeting. Voila, so this is uh, the stage as set by our members for uh, further uh, work in this field. At the request of the HCCH member states, therefore, the Permanent Bureau launched Codify um, to jumpstart the conversation on commercial, digital, and financial matters. What are the most important trends? What are the cross-border legal issues? And how can the HCCH provide uh, solutions uh, in this uh, field? The Permanent Bureau has brought together experts to present on a wide range of uh, subjects. The Codify Digital Economy Tracks continue the Permanent Bureau's exploration of distributed ledger technology and fintech, ranging from the nuts and bolts, if I may say so, of cryptocurrencies to emerging topics like algorithmic law, central bank digital currency, metaverses, and indeed sustainable finance. On the other side of the Codify coin, and yes, the pun is intended, the Permanent Bureau has created an opportunity to consider and promote the HCCH principles on choice of law, as well as the HCCH Securities and Trusts Conventions that I mentioned before, each with their own discussion track, uh, which serve as, dare I say, a sort of a de facto special uh, commission to assess uh, their operation and chart out a course for the future. The Permanent Bureau has also been mandated uh, to work, as I said, with organizations such as our sisters, Ancitral and Unidroit, and I'm, uh, of course, as I said, particularly pleased today to have the heads of uh, these two organizations with whom we work very closely uh, to discuss the work that is undergoing and planned for our three organizations in regard to uh, digital uh, economy. Um, tripartite cooperation and coordination has, as a matter of fact, uh, always been uh, an important aspect of our, of our work and uh, efforts. Um, not only do the three secretariats uh, follow each other's work by attending uh, the respective uh, meetings of the organizations, including the experts meetings, but also uh, the, the, the council meetings or the equivalent of the council meetings, uh, but we also coordinate uh, our work at the level of uh, the heads of the organizations with uh, the three of us uh, and other colleagues uh, meeting uh, once a year uh, to coordinate and uh, exchange on uh, ongoing uh, work and uh, specific projects uh, run by one of the uh, sister organizations. And I think it's very important uh, that we uh, continue to do so, in particular 
in a field like uh, the one that uh, we are currently discussing because there the, the, the various uh, mandates and indeed the contributions, uh, the technical contributions of uh, the three organizations really uh, cross, uh, if not to say uh, overlap. Uh, for example, what uh, we at the HCCH do is we follow the work of Ancitral on e-commerce, uh, as mentioned by Anna, very important work uh, that has been ongoing for quite some time, and uh, we have to salute the, the vision of uh, Ancitral in this field. Uh, we also observe uh, the very advanced work uh, done by Unidroit's working group on digital assets and uh, private law, uh, very important work indeed. Um, we also follow the joint project on uh, taxonomy being undertaken and we hope to build on the excellent work that both sister organizations have done so far in their respective uh, fields. So uh, again, I, I have to stress that uh, whatever we do here at the HCCH will not be to reinvent the wheel and redo work that has been done uh, in other organizations, but to build on uh, the work that has been uh, developed and, and see what added value uh, the work of the HCCH could uh, contribute. The nature of the digital sector is such that there is always, from our perspective, a private international law aspect to transactions, disputes and dealings in the field. Whether party autonomy can be properly put in place, what limits there are, uh, can or should be on party autonomy, which I think is a crucial principle in this field. Questions of what is the applicable law, how the forum uh, is chosen, and how decisions are recognized uh, and enforced. And again, there some of our previous work may indeed uh, help us to uh, advance these discussions uh, further. But these are questions that will keep arising in the context of the digital uh, space. Um, maybe on that I can uh, turn back to my colleagues and uh, invite you, ask you what do you uh, think uh, about this uh, coordination aspect. Uh, I guess the, the, the nature of the topic is such uh, that there is indeed uh, room and space for the three of us to, to cooperate and exchange. What do you think? Maybe Ignacio first this time. Sorry, sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Christophe, for your uh, uh, very balanced and uh, excellent introduction. Um, indeed, this is an area uh, where Defining the contours is very difficult, and indeed it's an area where there is always a jurisdiction, but especially a applicable law question uh, envisaged. Uh, that is absolutely true. Um, so um, the um, coordination with The Hague and the participation of The Hague in these projects, I obviously speak for my organization, um, is absolutely key and paramount, uh, since we acknowledge the primacy of the uh, Hague Conference as the main expert on prior international law matters, of course. So, um, I, concerning how um, di digital assets, or so excuse me, excuse me, I'm talking about, always talking about uh, the, the thing that we're doing, technology and technology matters in the law, uh, um, affect uh, the work that we do and therefore the need to coordinate. I think we should perhaps first uh, make a difference between um, two uh, streams of work. One of them would be the need that we have indeed identified and probably the same happens to, to both of you um, concerning the um, update and adjustment of our existing instruments in the light of the new technologies. Therefore, you revise your own texts because new technologies so require, uh, and this would affect pretty much any type of, uh, uh, of instrument in the past, from contract law to secure transactions to, uh, to any other type, really. Uh, and we are in the process of looking back to our own instruments and trying to see how new technologies work in this sense and, and what we can do um, to update them. Uh, and it's not an easy job, it's quite demanding actually. And in this type of work, um, 
we are on our own in a way, you know, uh, since you are updating your own, uh, your own work, uh, of course, one always has to be aware of what's there, not only for its own documents and instruments, but for that, that those of the others, the, the existing standards. But it's mostly a lonely work. Um, the other part, which is the most important one, is that which concerns subject matters which are new uh, and that uh, concern instruments in the making. Uh, there, um, I think we, what we need to do is, is make sure that information flows adequately, that uh, participation of each other in the discussions uh, of the others is uh, streamlined uh, and uh, to the extent possible in light of resources uh, um, intense. Uh, and uh, or at least that we manage to provide the information in a way in which we manage to minimize the, the need of the other organizations to um, uh, to spend their own resources in, in the other's projects, which is an important part. Um, I think, and I see our coordination in these matters not as a burden, but rather as an opportunity of cross fertilization, really. Uh, and therefore, uh, although obviously I see there is an internal cost built into the system, I, I think that um, this is a great opportunity for, for uh, our organizations to help each other. And uh, I could give a very good example uh, of the uh, most helpful, helpful input provided by The Hague in our recent working group on, uh, on digital assets and, and the excellent participation of, of Deputy Secretary General uh, Jerry Gauss-Colat. So um, coordination needs to happen, information needs to flow, it's doing it, uh, the setup is there and we need to turn this into an opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio. That, I think, is a, a very important uh, aspect of our cooperation, our work, uh, indeed. Anna, please, may I ask you to um, share your views on that? Thank you very much. Uh, well, the, uh, the way we approached uh, the developments of the digital economy um, that has been, and I think we all agree, uh, greatly accelerated by the pandemic, uh, is really to look at it from uh, the point of view of um, how do these technologies impact uh, in the positive and in the negative sense um, the, the way of trading and digital trade in its very broad, as I was explaining uh, at the outset, in its broad exception. Um, and we started looking um, at it two ways. First, as Ignacio said, we have a very solid uh, framework on uh, e-commerce. So it's moving e-commerce into digital trade is, uh, is something which is, I would say, almost generational and, and quite obvious, but it needs to be done. And the, the, the way we have approached it uh, is to begin with a taxonomy. And uh, as Ignacio was, uh, was referring to, it's a taxonomy which has uh, been sort of a methodology for us to uh, start exploring these technologies without getting carried away by the technology itself, but rather seeing at how it impacts uh, the way of transacting, which is in fact our uh, bread and butter. We've looked at uh, indeed uh, digital ledger, distributed ledger technology. We've looked at data transactions, at artificial intelligence and contracting, at digital assets, at the platform economy. Uh, and we've done that together with Indwa. And after this exploratory phase, uh, the uh, uh, two organizations sort of picked, uh, picked and chose uh, and put forward to their membership, because that's something I'm going to come back to at a later stage, um, uh, put forward to the membership the areas where they thought there was relevance with uh, previous work or ongoing work, um, as was the case for us with identity management and trust services. Um, and um, we also added to that, of course, this being an, an area of, uh, of Ancitral's turf uh, dispute resolution, we also started a project which is a separate project which is also uh, 
um, which also has this exploratory dimension to it. Uh, it's the stock taking on dispute resolution in the digital economy, which is something that we can also talk to you again uh, after uh, we've explained all of this. So um, what did we, um, what did the commission pick? The commission picked two topics uh, and asked us to look into a third one. One is to start working on artificial intelligence in contracting, and that is what the working group uh, at its next session, beginning of October, is going to do. And the second project is on data transactions. Our uh, approach to the digital economy was very much based on the analysis by our um, colleagues from UNCTAD uh, that identified two pillars to the digital economy. One is the data economy, the other one is the platform economy. So what we want is to have a, a foot in each of these two pillars. So we, we're working on, on data transactions. We've started preparing our working papers and the working group will look at it in the spring session. And for AI and contracts, it's now in front of the forthcoming working group. And then there's a third um, element that we put forward to the commission at this uh, session, which is to uh, to work on, and that is very relevant to the work you were mentioning, to work on um, what we call the main issues of DLT contracting, uh, in the sense uh, in taking the same approach as we did with the um, main issues in cloud contracting. Uh, which is a uh, text that was prepared by the Secretariat and later on uh, endorsed by the, the working group and by the Commission. And so we're going to carry out a similar kind of, you know, main, main legal issues in contracting when DLT is involved. And that is, of course, going to draw on your, on your expertise. Um, but what I wanted to really say is that in terms of coordination, uh, there is a lot that we can do, of course. And as you mentioned, Christoph, we have these, uh, we have this dialogue or this trialogue uh, that we carry out regularly. But I think it's also very important to um, to highlight the role of the member states, because at the end of the day, uh, the bosses are not us, but the member states. And it's to the member states to decide how they want to go about our cooperation, our coordination. And uh, you know, I'm just uh, uh, quoting from uh, last year's General Assembly resolution, which endorses the efforts and initiatives of the Commission <laughs> as the core legal body within the United Nations system and the field of international trade law, aimed at increasing coordination and cooperation. So they say that very clearly on legal issues of international regional organizations active in the field of international trade law, including legal issues relating to the digital economy. So it's black and white in the General Assembly's resolution that uh, yes, they want the Commission and the Member States to cooperate and coordinate and it's to them actually to tell us how they want us to do it um, and to be very clear in uh, in their um, in their the, the way they they ask us to uh, to work together because you know working together is something we have in our DNA it's part of our uh, secretariat's role but uh, there's not much more we can do than uh, what our member states tell us to do so that's really uh, something that uh, you know I come to realize in, in various instances uh, where, you know, at the end of the day, we have to get back to the bosses and say, look, you know, how do you want us to work together? Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, I can only echo the essence of uh, your comments about the importance of this uh, coordination and the, uh, the cooperation. Uh, we have discussed this uh, various times uh, as part of our tripartite uh, coordination. I think one of the challenges is to see 
how best uh, this, this joint work and cooperation is to be reflected in the work program of each of our organizations. Uh, but you are, of course, absolutely right that uh, the, 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 the key there uh, is the, uh, the member's opinion and uh, how to uh, uh, take this uh, collective uh, joint work uh, forward. Um, to me, the, for, for me, the, the takeaway is that the, the digital economy is, is a topic where the work of the three organizations, maybe more than any other topic, is, is converging. Uh, each has received requests from their members to study and provide guidance on different aspects of uh, the topic. And the coordination is important, but also challenging. Um, the the landscape of the digital economy and uh, DLT in particular continues to shift at surprising speed. It's hard for someone like me uh, to to follow these developments, I must say. But uh, this rapid pace of development has raised important questions among our respective membership, academia, and also other uh, observers. Indeed, the developments of the digital economy uh, have been challenging the underpinnings of finance and trade, how society uh, can be organized, a rather fundamental aspect of all of this, and even the, the fundamental characteristics of money, uh, value, uh, and, and art. You know, we look at all these things differ differently than uh, just a few uh, years ago. And these changes have entrenched uh, proponents of DLT who see the, the, the changes as old advancements uh, over false systems, but simultaneously have emboldened skeptics uh, who have long warned about the, the, the risks of volatility in this field. So different forces are uh, at work here. And of course, we have to uh, take that into uh, account. Um, I believe our organizations, like many other observers, fall in between, expecting that in the middle to long term, there will be a refinement of uh, DLT applications and practices. And this uh, session is presented uh, as the overarching session of Codify to underscore the commitment of HCCH, Ancitral, uh, and UNIDRA to cooperatively explore uh, this intersection of technology, economics, uh, and law. There are many components of the digital economy that will benefit from economic risk management, because uh -huh. at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to, to this to incentivize uh, the growth of the industry, ensuring business and legal certainty. That is always a, a key aspect. Um, these will have, beyond private international law matters, international trade implications and questions of the application of private law in a borderless new world, and I'm joining what uh, Ignacio said in this uh, regard about uh, about this. And there are gaps that our three sister organizations can and indeed should work uh, to fill both uh, separately and uh, together. From our uh, positions, strong developments in legal frameworks can be driven under our respective mandates, and this will help facilitate the legal certainty and predictability needed for a maturing uh, industry. Um, I think I may, uh, at this stage, uh, present you with a couple of questions, if you, if you don't mind, and uh, see uh, what you have to uh, say. Uh, in more specific terms uh, about uh, what we are uh, discussing here this week. What are, in, in your views, uh, the reasons that a robust legal framework uh, developed under each institution's individual mandate 
what are the reasons that it is important for further developments uh, in the digital economy space to, to take place? Um, why? Why are we doing all of this? Anna. Um, well, there are, there are uh, two aspects as far as international trade law is concerned, and that's, uh, that's Ansitra's uh, role in, in turf. Um, the, the way trading is taking place is no longer the same. It's trade is, is the way, I mean, like, like any other human activities, technology has impacted it uh, incredibly. And it's important to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we still uh, complete our mandate, which is um, modernization and harmonization when faced with new ways of trading. And the other part is indeed that there are other, um, other commodities or other um, assets being traded. And uh, that's the case of, of data. And uh, here again, we have to look into the way uh, these, these completely virtual assets and goods and commodities, uh, how they uh, play in, in terms of uh, exactly what you were mentioning, Christoph, uh, legal certainty, uh, assessing their legal nature and um, making sure that uh, when they are being traded, they're being traded with the uh, necessary um, facilitation, but also taking into account the more uh, the governance frameworks that are being developed and uh, that in the case of the uh, UN are being developed by other bodies of the UN uh, when it comes, for example, of uh, to uh, the internet governance or to uh, uh, even uh, data protection, which is not at all private, uh, private data protection, which is not at all in our mandate, but which is something that we have to take into account. And design the contours of what we do, taking into account that these frameworks are being developed. So uh, I think that this is very much uh, something that uh, can also apply, or this, this approach can also apply to the way the contours of the work of our different organizations is being designed, um, because indeed uh, the private international law component of whether it's trading or new uh, new tradables, new tradable uh, goods or, or commodities uh, is very relevant. Um, the, the fact that you know not uh, not one single transactions or that transactions very little involve um, a trader, a, a buyer and a purchaser and a platform all being located within the same jurisdiction, of course, raises issues of conflict of law, raises issue of conflict of jurisdiction. And all of this needs to be looked at uh, through the lens of private international law. So I think that's, that's really something that uh, is part and parcel of developing a comprehensive framework and what we are aiming at doing is to do the, the trade part of it, because that's, that's our job, uh, but without stepping on the toes of those who have uh, a, a special um, um, mandate and expertise and experience in a private international law. So all of this, I see that feeding into uh, our respective work in, in this area uh, as just as much as the work of other bodies in the UN feed uh, or, or draw contours to what we uh, are going to do. So, for example, we're going to work on data, but not on data governance and certainly not on data privacy and also not on data localization, which is an issue that is going to be looked at in the WTO. So that's that's the way I see our, our sort of, our puzzles pieces fitting together when, when contributing to a broader framework. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Ignacio, why is a robust legal framework needed for further developments in this field? Thank you. 
there is very little I can add to what both of you have already said, and I thank you for for sparing me that uh, task because I could have not done it as well. I just like to uh, perhaps um, synthesize in a way um, a couple of ideas, uh, always considering that I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I think a robust legal framework in this special subject matter is particularly important for three reasons which I've been mentioned. One of them is um, the need for increased legal certainty. This is a new subject and therefore uh, it's or unregulated or regulated in different ways across the globe. Therefore, coming up with uh, um, a standard in a way or, 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 or some uh, uh, proper uh, transnational legal analysis can be very useful and very helpful uh, everywhere. So if you add legal certainty, those assets which use this specific technology, be it, whether they are assets or data or, um, or more generally data, they will um, benefit from, from, from certainty because we have heard from, uh, from the industry, uh, from representatives of the industry and from governments that in part still today, the hindrance to the use of this technology is precisely that they don't know what the legal framework is, at least in the most extreme uh, items or points. So second, um, some level of harmonization is perhaps desirable, uh, especially if, if you think, uh, again, linked with legal certainty, because it will probably um, lower transaction costs and foster investment in this type of, of, of instruments. Uh, and third, it implies uh, the work of transnational institutions to bolster a legal framework internationally, it implies to some extent a modernization, especially for those jurisdictions which have uh, perhaps um, a more limited amount of, uh, of resources to come up with uh, a, a proper, uh, a fully modern system. So it's those three things, increasing legal certainty, harmonization and modernization that uh, could be absolutely key. I think what we need to remember, and this is perhaps a matter which is different to other matters over which we've done work in the past, which is it's as new as it gets. And therefore, the work that we do is, of course, not built on nothing, but it's not built on hundreds of years of transactions that have happened in other instruments. If you can do a wonderful uh, piece of work on contract law, but contracts have existed forever. Uh, this type of, of assets are different and therefore guidance provided by organization, organizations such as ours, which have a global constituency, which have experts from everywhere, and which uh, have <laughs> no uh, particular interest beyond doing a good job, can be extremely helpful, I think. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Ignacio. I think that was a, a very valuable uh, addition to our previous comments. And again, an expression in different form of uh, the, the, the value of uh, coordination and cooperation between the three sisters, because we, we do bring together a different set of, uh, of expertise. And I think that's all the more important as the topic is indeed new and we all uh, continue to to learn uh, from each other um, ignacio if i may just uh, throw another uh, question uh, at you uh, trying to look ahead i guess uh, maybe in some sort of a crystal ball even but uh, what specific legal innovation will be the game changer in the digital economy space well I, I am afraid I'm not very good with uh, crystal balls. I um, <laughs> run an organization which is uh, whose work is triggered by proposals from member states, countries generally don't need to be member states and, uh, and international organizations. So I'd like to see ourselves in a way, and I believe in, part, in good parts the same for, for, for all three sisters, as notaries or recipients of those subject matters which are in need of, 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 of transnational law work. I am, I have no problem to recognize that I am not an expert, a legal exp uh, an expert in technology at all. So I'm afraid I cannot uh, 
answer intelligently this question. What I will tell you, uh, Christophe, and I apologize for not being very useful in this, uh, in this reply, is that um, we already are working um, on, on, on topics um, which are relatively broad. And uh, in principle, the understanding of the money that we have is that as to continue to uh, to build upon those. Uh, so um, there is already a lot of work to be done in the next three years. I doubt we can take on much more new stuff, but uh, I'm not sure. So I will leave it open at this stage, if you will indulge me. <clears throat> Sure, and I fully, fully understand uh, your reaction, and I actually share it from uh, from my perspective, uh, Ignacio. And uh, I'm just curious to see uh, what uh, will come uh, our way. Uh, Anna, anything to add in this respect? Yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think um, what is important, and, and uh, you have alluded to both of you uh, to the the pace the speed at which uh, these new technologies come our way and uh, how uh, we have to also become more agile, which is one of these buzzwords that we've heard since the pandemic. We have to be more agile in our way of uh, addressing these um, new technologies and not the technologies per se, but uh, the impact they have on the way of doing trade or on uh, new new assets or new uh, commodities that uh, that appear uh, to be traded. And so um, there, there, is, there are two, two points I would like to make in this regard. One is that what we've tried to do is to be um, very, um, to have a very broad approach to our exploratory work. Uh, we have a, um, a a sandbox initiative uh, with uh, the Department of Justice of Hong Kong that we call the IDIP, which is looking into uh, the, the, the role of um, um, uh, platforms in dispute resolution. And it's really very much about uh, following all these developments uh, by keeping this dialogue open between the, the private sector that obviously develops these and uses these technologies and, um, and our regulators and facilitators uh, in, in, the, in the form of, uh, of states. Um, and we do the same thing for this dispute resolution in the digital economy, which is a project that uh, the, the government of Japan has brought to uh, ANSI trial with the, with the view of really taking stock. And then once we've taken stock, uh, we, we come up with, you know, what, where are their needs, where are their gaps, but, but something that needs to be followed uh, in an ongoing manner. And the second um, reflection, um, listening to all these, to all this discussion is that we are uh, and we, I think we, we have a big responsibility uh, also in looking at the digital gap. Uh, we have um, been working on international trade uh, with growing membership, with more, you know, being part of the UN, with, uh, of course, all the UN uh, member states. What is really important at this juncture is that uh, when embarking into the digital economy, we don't uh, commit the same mistakes at, uh, that, were, that happened in, in previous uh, industrial revolutions and that we don't again leave uh, so many countries and so many actors behind. So that is really something that we put at the core of our uh, exploratory work is to look at how uh, these these technologies and what they bring uh, they can bring it to all and how the uh, the um, um, the challenges that come with these new technologies can be overcome uh, also through the, uh, the the legal frameworks that uh, that we are working on and we're putting forward so that is really, I would say, the, the red thread uh, through, through uh, one is to really be agile and, and try to see what's happening and not, you know, pick a subject and then say, okay, we're going to work on that for the next 10 years because 
We cannot do that anymore. We don't have this luxury. Uh, and the second one is while doing this, let's be as inclusive as we can. And let's make sure that, you know, as many countries as possible can participate. Because at the end of the day, that's how uh, we're going to be able to deliver something meaningful. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. I think these were other uh, very uh, important uh, words. I think what you said is uh, indeed uh, an important expression of meaningful universality and inclusiveness. And I think that's a, a strategic uh, tenant that applies uh, to all our uh, organizations uh, and something that we really uh, need to keep in mind. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, Jerry and her team, uh, who have developed the uh, the program of Codify, have taken that into account also. And uh, there is a specific segment on uh, sustainable and equip equitable uh, finance and democratic access to uh, to finance uh, access that is uh, part of this program. And I think that uh, makes it indeed uh, very uh, very relevant uh, also from uh, from that uh, perspective. Uh, we are running. Uh, out of time uh, because uh, this has been uh, has been uh, a very uh, interesting and uh, stimulating uh, panel uh, to make it maybe just a bit more personal at the end with a final uh, question uh, what are the developments that you are most excited about uh, in this field uh, Anna first uh, trading data uh, data is really the uh, oil of the 21st century with, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm plagiating what has been said uh, again and again. And uh, trading in data is what is going to allow everyone to embark into the digital economy. Uh, you need data to develop artificial intelligence. You need data to, you know, whatever you do, you, you need data nowadays. So it's really the commodity. So to me, um, trading in data is really the um, the development that I'm most excited about. Thank you, Anna. Ignacio? Right, thanks. Well, <clears throat> one loves all their children equally, right? So there is really no, no preference. Whatever work we do and we will do um, will be uh, our favorite in every moment. But uh, if, if you will indulge me, I, I think... I would take a, a slightly different approach. Uh, I think on the one hand, obviously, we are very excited about work on, on digital assets, uh, um, but um, perhaps what I find from a technical standpoint fascinating and also quite complex is something which might seem less sexy uh, on its face, which is understanding classic commercial contract and financial law in the light of new technologies and how that is going to change the way we do business and the way we understand markets and the way we protect the stakeholders that participate in the markets. So rather than a new particular project, I think we're going to have to spend a lot of resources and a lot of brains will, be, will need to be put to understanding how things are changing uh, in existing uh, legal legal structures. So I think that's uh, what's going to keep us busy and I find it quite fascinating. Thank you very much Ignacio and on this uh, almost philosophical note if I may say uh, it uh, gives me uh, pleasure to thank both of you again wholeheartedly uh, for having participated in this uh, panel. Uh, I think it was a very meaningful way to kick off uh, what is going to be an exciting, stimulating and informative uh, week. Uh, my personal takeaway is that uh, this again just shows the importance of uh, cooperation and coordination between uh, the sisters and uh, we are on the right track uh, to continue uh, this meaningful uh, cooperation. Thank you very much and I wish you all a, a wonderful and exciting Codify week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you and an exciting Codify week to all.